Father, thank you for this evening and, and uh, the opportunity to gather together in your name and to study a word. Father, thank you so much for the wealth of truth, Lord, that we're learning from the scriptures and from the insight of Dr. Fruchtenbaum, Lord, how instructional it is and, and how wonderful it is to fill in the gaps, Lord, and to, to make the Gospels come alive in high definition. Lord, help us, Lord, not just to store knowledge, but God, to be transformed by it. Lord, to be transformed by the simplicity of salvation, the gospel message itself. May we be liberated from the bondage of performance and, and uh, projection, Lord, <clears throat> and just rest in you. Lord, guide us, teach us, illuminate our understanding now in Jesus' name. All right, so just kind of in summary from last week, uh, what we talked about uh, on the nature of what happens to a man when he dies. So we talked about um, Hades or Sheol and uh, having it being divided between the righteous and the unrighteous. Uh, on the un unrighteous side, you have the abyss, the bottomless pit, temporary holding place for demons. The abyss will be opened up in Revelation in the, in, during the tribulation period, and these demons will be released to torment men. Uh, Tartarus was a, play, a permanent place for, for demons who left their natural abode in Genesis chapter 6, uh, cohabitating with human women to corrupt the line of the seed of the woman. They were bound and are in Tartarus, and then and then hell is <clears throat> where the unbelievers are in a place of temporary torment, in fire, in flame, and fire. The righteous have been delivered out of what was called Abraham's bosom. It's where the Old Testament saints would go, paradise, uh, until Jesus Christ paid for their sins and then they were released and were taken captive by the Lord Jesus Christ into heaven. So now when the righteous die, when we die, we go directly to heaven. So the unbelievers are still there, every unbeliever from, from Cain all the way up till today are in this place of hell in Hades, this compartment of Hades or Sheol. At the great white throne judgment seat, which will be at the end of the Messianic kingdom, the thousand year reign of Christ, at the end of that period, this will all be opened up. The unbelievers will stand before God at the great white throne judgment seat. They will be judged according to their works. It will be discovered that their name is not written in the Lamb's book of life. And they will be cast into the lake of fire, which is the eternal, permanent dwelling place of the unbeliever. In the eternal conscious yeah. torment. Did you look up here? It seems like I saw it this week. Sorry. Um, the state of the lost. The lost are eternally separated from God. Their state is unalterable. It's eternal. It cannot change, and there is no chance to be saved after death. The lost are in torment. The lost are conscious of their lost a lostness or lost state. They remember opportunities they had to respond correctly and did not. Okay, the preparation of disciples by the king. So instruction concerning forgiveness. This is uh, Luke chapter 17, verses 1 through 4. on page 178 of the army, and it reads, it says, And he said to his disciples, It is impossible but that occasions of stumbling should come, but woe unto him through whom they come. It were well for him if a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were thrown into the sea, rather than that he should cause one of these little ones to stumble. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sin, rebuke him. 
If he repent, forgive him. And if he sin against you seven times in the day, and seven times turn again, hey Shirley. How are you? Hey, Cheryl. <sighs> Sorry. I hate being late. We're surprised you're here. We're... Oh, yeah. Okay, go on. Sorry. Okay, take heed to yourselves if your brother sin, rebuke him. If he repent, forgive him. If he sin against you seven times in the day, and seven times turn again to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Okay. Jesus is addressing his disciples concerning the previous section. They are to despise Phariseeism, but not to despise the Pharisees themselves. Jesus teaches to be careful not to give an offense, be careful not to take offense. He also teaches that when they are faced with a repentant person, it is mandatory to forgive them in unlimited fashion. Now something I wanted to point out here in regard to repentance. In the New Testament metanoia, is to change the mind. Notice this, it says, if your brother sin, rebuke him. If he repent, forgive him. Now notice this, if he sin against you seven times in the day, and seven times turn again to you, saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Now if repentance means that you turn from your sin, stop sinning. Why did he sin seven more times and repent seven more times? Because repent means change of mind. Not... That's right. Yeah. What was the Greek again? Metanoia. And the root of it actually means after knowledge. After knowledge. So, um, anyway, I, I that just kind of stood out to me. If, Another issue, I was having a real good discussion with uh, I was having a good discussion discussion with Miguel about salvation today. And uh, we're talking about church discipline, right? So remember we read in Matthew Matthew 18 about the steps of church discipline. And <laughs> you know, it makes it pretty clear. Church discipline, first of all, is for believers, right? And the only time you're going to apply discipline is if they're living in unrepentant sin or they have not turned from their sin. So therefore, you know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of speaking to myself. And you guys are like, why is he talking about this? But it's, to me, it's a big deal. When you, when you say salvation it requires you to turn from your sin and stop sinning, um, which is what they're saying when they say turn from your sin. Uh, then why is there church discipline? Because everyone that's saved would never need church discipline if that's what biblical repentance meant. And if they're not saved, then you wouldn't... You wouldn't exercise church discipline. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Anyway, just a thought. Okay, next one. Luke 17, verse 5 through 10. Um, okay, yeah, he points out, be careful not to, to give offense, take offense. Okay, I did, I read that information. Instruction concerning service. Verses 5 through 10. The apostles said to him, Lord, increase our faith. The Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, and you would say unto the sycamore tree, be you uprooted, be you rooted up, and be you planted in the sea, it would obey. It would obey you. But, who is there of you having a servant plowing or keeping sheep that will say unto him, when he has come in from the field, come straightway and sit down to, to meet, and will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird yourself and serve me, until I have eaten and drunken, and afterward you shall eat and drink. 
Does he thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded? Even so, you also, when you have done all the things that are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which it was our duty to do. Jesus gives his, his disciples instruction concerning service. The apostles ask Jesus to increase their faith. How do you increase faith? And I'll just pose the question, how do we increase faith? The only way that works for me is reading the Word of God okay. and realizing the truth of it. Like okay. His Word is demonstrably true, and that increases my faith. Okay. That, but that's like a work of God because it, he's working through this, so it's not like some work that I'm doing. Yeah, or some power of your own. Yeah, like mustering up faith on your own. Yes. And I'm gonna throw this out there. I was thinking about this. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Linda Richmond, coffee talk. Um. You hear a lot of times, I made a decision, or a call to make a decision to trust Christ, right? You hear this a lot. But really, when you think of it, and I, and I want the feedback here, salvation is never a decision. Salvation comes by revelation, and discipleship comes by decision. What do you think about that? I agree. I agree. My sister and I, that's what we were discussing on Facebook the other night, the book post I tried to tag you uh -huh. on. Yeah. But I deleted it because things got a little heated. Ugly and I didn't want it to keep going. <laughs> so um, she even, I was, she doesn't even <clears throat> know my testimony, basic testimony of Christ, which is sad, is because I'm the one that told her the gospel. Uh -huh. <laughs> But anyway, uh, and she was questioning my salvation because I lived in open and repentant sin for so long. And I had to remind her, do you remember going to the clubs and the parties with me, Sheila? <laughs> <laughs> you have the same sins as me, maybe just not as abundantly, you know. But um, <clears throat> she got really mad, and she was saying, it's based on a choice you make. Because, and she's under John Corson, who doesn't teach it, eternal security. So I can't believe that. John Corson didn't teach it. Yeah, so I thought yeah. he did. But, um, so, uh, I, I haven't heard anything else from him that I disagree with. He yeah. teaches through the Bible pretty plainly. It's hard to mess that up. Yeah. So, um, anyway, but <clears throat> she, um, she, I don't even think she's evaluated her own testimony because what I was saying was in my testimony, I was 13 and I was sitting there at a youth group hearing the whole gospel message and all the details of Christ, told very detailed cat and tales, everything. And um, <clears throat> so I don't remember choosing to believe it. I just believed it. And the first time I repeated it was when I told my sister while we were watching a movie called Stigmata where a woman super naturally receives the wounds of Christ and Shayla had no clue what was going on and I was able to detail it all out for her yeah. and the whole gospel message and then she ch started choosing to go to church after that and <clears throat> I never chose to go to church because every time I went it was like just lofty glances from lofty people you know oh, what I mean yeah, yeah, yeah. so anyhow that, that was my experience with it and she she's like no I, ch I chose to believe and I'm like, did, did you make, I didn't make that conscious choice. I just received it. Mm -hmm. I just received it. Yeah. I just believed it. There was yeah. no like, should I believe this? Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. was when I was, mine was, I felt like mine was a calling, you know, because the Holy Spirit was just right there whispering in my ear. And I heard it and down into my heart. Now, when you say whispering in your ear, you don't mean an audible voice. Oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> At my house, yes. No. <laughs> no, but it was the Holy Spirit, and I was just filled with it, and I couldn't wait for altar call. I mean, it was. I was like, yeah, I didn't make a conscious choice of, oh, I'm going to go forward today and be saved. Yeah. And even if you hadn't gone forward, 
you're saved. I never went forward. There was no altar call. Yeah, well, I was raised Pentecostal. I so. heard all that ask Jesus in your heart stuff, and I don't know how many times I prayed ask. Uh, <laughs> I thought my sin pushed Jesus out. Jesus, please come back in my heart. <laughs> I hope you did. Amen. <laughs> yeah, I went. I went. I made several altar call trips after my conversion, especially the Starlight Crusade. I think I went down a couple of times. Annual event. The football stadium of our old high school. And well, everything. a lot of it where I, when I grew up was you barely had room to get in your pew and sit down, let alone if you wanted to pray. You know, it's not like you could, if it's like you had to turn around and bump the pew in front of you to get your bum down to get on your knees, so the altar was right there. Yeah. And people just went down there and prayed, even people that were saved, they just went down and... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know. we, we went, when we were first married, we went to kind of a charismatic church where that was standard mm -hmm. uh -huh. it was they spoke but in that was standard. first church of God they do it openly but they they did and they taught you could lose your salvation which is but anyway yeah they did have the altar call yeah and people would just go down yeah you just go down and pray yeah <clears throat> I heard um, Jay Vernon doing that recently but I think I already told you that that he He said it wasn't his normal thing, right? I don't remember him saying that, but it was on a Sunday. And maybe it was a, re a recording of his church service or something. But I was surprised that he did an altar call. Yeah. Plus, on Wednesday nights was prayer meeting night, and that's what we did. We went into the auditorium and everybody either some people turned around and prayed in their the elderly people just sat in their in the pew and stuff but most everybody got down on their knees and prayed I mean prayed it was a prayer meeting <laughs> why does the flesh hate that so much the, what? the idea that we don't choose God but he chooses us why does the flesh hate that because you want to be in control. This has been me working this out for a few years, and it took me, like, a, literally, like, most of the time I've been in Grace Bible Ministries contemplating this in Scripture to yield to this position. Yeah. As it, I've been but reading it's so through, freeing once you realize yeah. it. It really is. It is. Like, when as many as... It's not a work you have to do if God's going to save who's going to save. Yeah. It's not a work you have to do, and then it makes it so easy to just walk in and God's going to move you to do what you're supposed to, and you don't have to think about it or worry about it, or how am I going to do this? Yeah. Did I do it right? Did I, was my prayer right? You know, all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Did I remember saying Jesus' name? And this is what my sister's doing this week. She's beating herself up over, I didn't do this with Grandma. I didn't do that with Grandma. Oh, that's always normal but, after a death. Yeah, but she, it's sad because that's the place she's in. Like, she doesn't realize that God, she still thinks she has to work, you know. And it's, and I've been there, so I feel for her. And, you know, and I'm like, Sheila, you were moved to do the work you were required because she preached Romans 10 to my grandma and then I turn on Facebook and you're preaching out of Romans 10 and posting out of Romans 10 yeah. and it just told me that, that my grandma heard that and received it and she needed it, you know and I, and I was like, Sheila, you did, you did that God moved you to do what you were supposed to do Grandma's in heaven, rejoice, you know like. and Grandma's salvation has nothing to do, nothing with, you. To do with you Exactly. Even if you sat there in the corner, I'm not sharing the gospel. God's going to save His vessels of mercy. It's going to happen. Some, a seven-year-old's going to go with us. Exactly, that's what he. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, and my thought was that as I've been going through chapter 9, 10, 11, my thought was, it's, there's the element of human pride that wants final say. I want veto authority over God's decision. And what's interesting is this is from believers who obviously in their heart have said, no, I, I want to agree and submit to the gospel and receive it, but I want the final say. Mm -hmm. And it's just that, that last, I'm going to cling to this choice that I have, that God's like, ah, wait, wait for me, God. I think it's a control issue. <laughs> yeah. 
they just want to be like it was my choice. The illusion that we're in control of anything. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That's right. Yeah. Um, Ken's daughter. She lives in El Paso, and we hear from her more FaceTiming us with the children than anybody else. And right after we talked to her the other night, she uh, texted and said, Oh, I forgot to tell you guys that Wyatt, who's going to be 6, April 10th, came to me the other day and said, um, Last night, I talked to Great Grandpa Ken in heaven, and Jesus was there too. And, uh, of course, all the family wrote, Oh, how sweet, how precious. Oh. And I was like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> and so I read it to Ken. He goes, Ann, what do you got to say about it? And I go, I don't believe in that crap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and, and he says, well, it does make you wonder. And I said, no, not me. Not me. No. I said, He's probably thinking of you when he says he didn't mean to say great grandpa Ken, you know, that kind of stuff. I said it was a dream or something. I said, No, I don't I don't believe any spirit come down. I says, And your dad in heaven? Hmm. And he started laughing. <laughs> That's who he is named after his dad. Yeah, but he's a junior. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So anyway, but I I thought, I hope she doesn't say, how come you didn't reply, Shirley? <laughs> Share the gospel. I was like, nah, I don't believe in that crap. <laughs> That's of the devil. Uh, yeah. <coughs> uh, okay, so, so yeah, um, we increase our faith by, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Now, Fruchtenbaum points out um, the aspect of obedience uh, and how that also increases faith. Jesus describes the power of faith in the story of the uprooted tree. Then he describes the role of a servant to his master. If it is of one of selfless service, no need for thanks, as it is part of the job. Whatever we do for the Lord, we do because it's one's duty, and the performance of one's duty increases faith. Faith increases by the serving of the Lord. So. I kind of, I kind of, well, I do. I agree with what he's saying here, and yet, without the word of God, obviously, there's not going to be faith. But thinking about victories, you know, as you step out in faith, and God answers, um, and that reinforces. And and what do you do? You step out in faith, based on the word of God, and then you take an action, a step of faith, with which without the Bible being the, the supporting foundation of that step. In other words, you have a preceding faith that compelled you. Instead of walking this way, I'm going to walk this way. And when you do step out in obedience, I mean, think of Peter, right? Peter stepping out of the boat. Wow, <laughs> I'm standing on this water. Um, but yet what compelled him to come out of the boat was the Lord's command. Come. So there is kind of a synergy there as we are obedient to God and we see God work. And that work is in harmony with the Word of God that we read. It strengthens our faith. We're able to, we kind of push back the boundaries of unbelief and we're able to operate in a wider sphere of faith, I think. Our problem is we're, we, we're scared and we're just comfortable. Like, okay, I've got enough faith. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, God is always calling us to a greater a greater walk of faith with Him. Um, and, it, and it really it affects everything. The way we handle our money, the way we interact with one another, our prayer lives, um, everything like that. So, uh, okay, now we'll look at... Did I, did I do that? Okay. The sign of resurrection. John 11... Verses 1 through 44. What's that? I think yeah. Steve was out there. It might oh. be Steve coming in. Um, what was he out there when you came in? Mm -mm. No? Okay, maybe he. I didn't see anybody anywhere. Steve or Steven? Steve. 
Steve. Oh, really? Yeah, he was in his van. He hasn't come in yet. There's no van out there. He was the worst. Your car, your car, your car. John 11, 1 through 16. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus, and Eleazar of Beit Anya, Anya, which is Bethany, of the village of Miriam and her, her sister Martha. And it was that Miriam who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Eleazar was sick, or Lazarus was sick. The sisters therefore sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest, he whom you love, is sick. But when Yeshua heard it, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified thereby. Now Yeshua loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When therefore he heard that he was sick, he abode at that time two days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, Let us go into uh, Yehuda, uh, Judea, Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were but now seeking to stone you, and you go there again? Yeshua answered, Are there not twelve hours in the, in the day? If a man walk in the day... He stumbles not, because he sees the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. These things he spoke, spoke he, and after this he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus is fallen asleep, but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. <coughs> the disciples therefore said unto him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Yeshua had spoken of his death. They thought that he spoke of taking rest and sleep. Then Yeshua therefore said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. To the intent, Abel, you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. You will be on the video, Bill, if you sit there, I'm just saying. You'll be facing the camera. Turn your back. Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad for your sakes I was not there, to the intent that you may believe. Now see, here's an example where they're going to witness a, a miracle of Jesus, and it's going to expand their faith. They've already had saving faith. They know he's the Messiah. And we're going to see in the, in the response of Martha and, and Mary, they obviously are saved, they believe in his Messiahship, but they don't understand his power. <laughs> Uh, I'm glad for your sakes I was not there, to the intent that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Thomas, therefore, who is called Didymus, said unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. All right. In this passage, we find the first sign of Jonah, which is, anyone, anyone, the sign of Jonah? Why is this important, the sign of Jonah? Resurrection is the sign of Jonah. And Jesus said that he would only give one sign, and that would be the sign of Jonah, to the adulterous and unbelieving generation. So we're going to see this play out as he raises Lazarus from the dead. There are three instances where, where God gives the Jewish people the sign of Lazarus, uh, the sign of Jonah. This is the first one with the resurrection of Lazarus. The second one is when Jesus himself is raised. And the third example is when the two witnesses are raised in the middle of the tribulation period. Why is it called the sign of Jonah? Because uh, Jonah's uh, being swallowed by the whale. Yeah. Jesus, and, and then he's in the belly of the whale and then spit, spat out. Jesus taught that was a sign of the resurrection. So he said, so just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days, three nights, even so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth.
three days and three nights. So it's a type of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Okay. <clears throat> Contain this passage is the seventh of John's seven signs, the fifth of John's seven I am's. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Isn't it interesting? In so many ways, it, it's hard to wrap our minds around. So, Jesus Christ didn't come bringing the truth. He says, I am the truth. Jesus didn't come and show us the way. He says, I am the way. Jesus didn't come to show us resurrection. He says, I am the resurrection. I am the life. So, when we believe in Christ and we're immersed into Him, <clears throat> because He's raised, we're immersed in Him, then we must be raised. He is the resurrection. And He's going to demonstrate it. Uh, here we also see the sub-theme of the conflict of light and darkness. Jesus had up to this point raised a few people from the dead. However, this resurrection was accomplished after the person had been dead for four days. The others are recorded with only a few verses, while this, this resurrection is recorded with 44 verses. The others were witnessed by a few, and they were enjoined to silence about them. Here, a multitude of Jews are present and is done in public. This is the sign that Jesus had been promising. When he said that the only sign you will receive is the sign of Jonah, the leaders of the nation will have, will have to respond to this miracle. And they will again choose to reject it, exactly proving the point that Jesus made in the story of Lazarus in the previous passage. That for those who do not believe in Moses and the prophets, nothing can convince them to believe. So remember the rich man and Lazarus? Lazarus died. The rich man said, well, send, send, if someone were raised from the dead, send Lazarus. My brothers will believe if someone came from the dead. And Abraham said, no. If they won't believe Moses and the prophets, they wouldn't even believe if someone were raised from the dead. And so we'll see this demonstrated with Lazarus' resurrection. Um, we will look at this passage in four sections as shown in the outline. Okay, the death of Lazarus. A message comes to Jesus from Mary and Martha that their brother is sick fatally ill, and the sisters are asking Jesus to come and heal him. Jesus deliberately tarries, telling his disciples that this is for the glory of God and that he will be glorified through this. Did you pick that up in the text? Yes. Where Jesus says it's for the glory of God that the, that the Son of Man may be glorified. He's essentially identifying himself as God. That um, this is, sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God, the Son of God, may be glorified thereby. Jesus loves this family. They had to be wondering where he was. It is only a, a one-day walk to Bethany from where Jesus is. But upon hearing that Lazarus is sick, Jesus waits two more days. Jesus knows that Lazarus has died, though no one tells him, and then decides to depart for Bethany. The disciples are alarmed that Jesus wants to go back to Judea, where the Jewish leaders had been seeking to have him stoned. Notice in John 11:15 that Jesus says, quote, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, so that you may believe. <coughs> Fruchtenbaum asks, what does this statement tell us? Says, he answers, says, it tells us that there were even some among the disciples whose faith was not perfect. And honestly, I think we can say that about all the disciples at this point. I don't think, well, in fact, we know there's no testimony here. Even when, when Jesus says he's asleep and I'm going to go wake him, they're thinking in natural terms that he's just asleep, he's recovering. Then when Jesus says overtly, he's dead, and I'm going to go raise him, there's no indication of faith. In fact, they say, let's go so we can die with him. 
Um, notice that Thomas <laughs> stays true to the cheerful, trusting character he is portrayed as having. He says, let us go also so we can die too. Okay, Jesus and Martha, verse 17 through 27. Seems like we recently talked about this as well. Maybe it was Sunday morning about how um, Jesus delays his answer. So it appears as though, oh, oh, another, another thing I, I remember when this, because this passage was instrumental in my prayer for Stephen and his healing. The part where the, in verse 3 where um, Mary and Martha say, he whom thou lovest is sick. Uh, that's what popped out to me as I was reading the text when Stephen was on death's door. And so I put his picture and this that passage underneath and put it on his door. So every time I walked by, I would pray that over him. And it just popped out. It was a rhema that this was, God was going to do something. Um, but I remember reading that, and this will give you new insight as you're reading through the Gospels. When you see the disciples speaking with Jesus, you're really looking at a form of prayer. It's just that he's standing right there instead of in heaven. So when they're talking to him, so I realize that this is like a prayer. They're saying, Lord, he who thou lovest is sick. And so that became my prayer for my son. So it kind of gives new light when you're reading dialogue between the disciples and Jesus to look at it in form of a prayer and say, well, how did Jesus answer their dialogue? It's really the same way now as his, his children and his disciples, how he deals with us. Um, what else we got here? Okay, we read that. Okay, yeah, okay. Verse 17, so when Yeshua came, he found that he had been in the tomb four days already. Now Bethany was near unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Miriam to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Yeshua was coming, went and met him. But Miriam still sat in the house. Martha, therefore, said unto Yeshua, Lord, if you had been here, my brother had not died. And even now I know that whatsoever you shall ask of God, God will give you. Yeshua said unto her, Your brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Yeshua said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes on me, though he die, yet shall he live. Whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Listen to what she says. Yea, Lord, I have believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, even he that comes into the world. Jesus approaches Bethany, and hearing that he was approaching, Martha hurries out to meet him. Martha reproaches him for not having come when they called for him. Jesus reassures her that her brother will rise again, but she assumes he means he will rise in the resurrection of the last days. Martha recognizes Jesus' messianic claims, but does not recognize his power over death. John 11, 25, Jesus proclaims the fifth of John's I am's, I am the resurrection and the life. Martha proclaims her belief. Um, a few observations here. Um, let's see. <coughs> Your brother shall rise again. I know that he shall rise again the resurrection the last day. I am the resurrection and the life. Okay. Now notice what he says. I am the resurrection and I am the life. Now listen to this statement. I want you to tell me the correlation. He that believes on me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes on me shall never die. Do you believe this? 
what is he saying? It sounds contradictory. He that believes on me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes on me shall never die. Do you believe this? What is he talking about when he makes those two statements? Well, ESV uses the he it uses the whoever believes in me, though he shall die, he shall live. And <coughs> verse twenty six it uses uh, everyone <coughs> who is. It seems contradictory. But he's talking about eternal life. <coughs> okay, in which passage? Both. Um, <coughs> well, now listen, the first way he says, He that believes on me, though he die, yet shall he live. Yeah, it's talking about he'll resurrect and okay. have <coughs> eternal life. <coughs> Hold that one. And the second one, so you got you got a star for that. Okay, don't take it away. I will not, <coughs> unless you really boff an answer later. <coughs> <coughs> the second statement is, Whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. That's eternal life. Mm -hmm. He just said, I'm the resurrection, mm -hmm. and I'm the life. And now he expands those statements. He who lives and believes, or he who, he who believes on me, though he die, like Lazarus, yet shall he live, resurrection, the body. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. That's eternal life. That's the spirit. Spiritually, we have eternal life. As soon as the heart attack hits me, the consciousness remains. I just drift out of my body and am taken by the angels into heaven. Body falls down. I, I, don't, I don't skip a beat. I, 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 I have eternal life. So that's what he's, he's magnifying that. I'm the resurrection. And so therefore, if you believe on me, you're going to be raised. And I'm the life. And therefore, if you believe on me, you'll never die. That's the gospel. Same difference. Well, resurrection deals with the body. Yeah. And eternal life, in deals the context the we have eternal life, is with the spirit. Because mm -hmm. our body, even though I have eternal life, I'm still going to die physically if the rapture doesn't happen. Right. Yeah. But it's still the same difference. Shh. Taking that star. <laughs> okay. Do you believe this? Oh boy, Matt. Do you believe that's that's the question? Yep. Do you believe this? Now I, I don't think she got it. Because she she confesses her faith in his messiahship, which is saving faith. But I don't think she comprehends. It's like kinda like Shirley. Yea, Lord. <laughs> I have believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, he that comes into the world. So, and isn't that great too? I pointed this out to Jana. I don't know if she remembers this. You know, Martha, Martha is the worker, and she's the, you know, Lord, why didn't you make her work with me? And she kind of gets rebuked by Jesus, and she's always busy serving and kind of focusing on things that are less important. But did you notice the order? Might have been that last uh, passage. Um, that he loved. Yeah, it's back in the last passage in verse 5. Yeshua loved Martha mm -hmm. and her sister Mary mm -hmm. and Lazarus. And so the scripture mentioned Martha first. I just like that. Even though she's Martha, Martha, Martha. Somebody has to do all that. Yeah, but in that instance, she should, yeah. you know, should have been at his feet. Okay. Uh, Jesus and Mary. Okay, verse uh, 28 through 32. And when she said this, she went away and called Miriam her sister, secretly saying, The teacher is here and calls for you. And she, when she heard it, arose quickly and went unto him. So notice Jesus has still not come into the actual location of where Lazarus is buried. He's kind of like kind of like at a, 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 a one of those places you pull off on the freeway, those rest stop. a rest stop. It's kind of like he's, he's outside, hanging outside the camp and they're coming to him. Um, so Miriam 
she heard it, rose quickly, went to him. Now Yeshua was not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. The Jews then who were with her in the house, and you know, think about this. Jesus is probably doing this so he can have this intimacy with Mary and Martha. Because as soon as he gets there, he's going to be thronged. And, mm -hmm. and that's why he's doing this. The Jews then who were with her in the house and were consoling her, when they saw Miriam, that she rose up quickly and went out and followed her, supposing that she was going into the tomb to weep there. Miriam, therefore, when she came where Yeshua was, saw him, fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother had not died. That's when he rolled his eyes. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Ay, <laughs> Chihuahua. That's the second time I've heard that today. <laughs> no, he's not like us. So. No, I know. Mary comes out to meet Jesus being trailed by a group of Jewish mourners, both from the village and from Jerusalem. Mary likewise reproaches Jesus for not having come when they needed him. And that's something, he, I mean, he, he doesn't respond to that reproach. He doesn't respond scolding him. <laughs> she also reaffirms her belief in his messianic claim. So we also have a confession. Uh, I think it comes up the next chapter, or next portion. She also reaffirms her belief, belief in his messianic claims. Mary does not understand his power over death at this time. She is weeping. Okay. 33 through 44. When Yeshua therefore saw her weeping, okay, yeah, this is really important. When Yeshua therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, who came with her, he groaned in the spirit. And the word for groaned there means he was angry and was troubled and said, Where have you laid him? They said, Lord, come and see. Yeshua wept. Jesus wept. Shortest verse of the Bible. Jesus wept. The Jews therefore said, Behold how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of him that was blind have caused that this man also should not die? Yeshua, therefore, again groaning in himself, comes to the tomb. Now it was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Yeshua said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him, had been dead four days. Yeshua said unto her, Said I not unto you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Yeshua lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me, and I knew that you would hear me always. But because of the multitude that stands around, I said it, that they may believe that you did send me. When he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. He that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Yeshua said unto them, Loose him and let, let him go. Did you go? When you were in Israel, did they take you to where he was supposedly buried? Where Lazarus was? Uh -huh. No. Um, okay, John eleven thirty three, which describes the weeping of Mary and the crowd with her. The Greek word is better translated wailing or loud lamentation. You see that in the Middle East today. Uh -huh. See these news clips bombing. My understanding is also they have professional wailers, professional mourners who would come also. Well, and they do that at the weeping wall, don't they? No, it's not like that. It's yeah, they're they're not. Um, it's not like that. I mean, they're it's praying not. silently. It's oh, not, okay. It's not a big production. I mean, they may be speaking under their breath, but it's oh. not a wailing. Oh, well, I happen to know just how they sounded because that's how I sound at the summer. Um, the word here for loud la la lamentation, Clio, K L A I O, it occurs 40 times in the New Testament. Jesus is troubled and deeply moved in spirit. 
and compassionate for the suffering that death causes. The Greek term used for he wept means he shed tears silently. This is a different Greek word than the word for wailing. This word is dokrio, and it only happens in the New Testament in this verse. Some of the multitude take note of Jesus' love for Lazarus in John 11:36. Others in the multitude question whether, since he had performed a messianic miracle of opening the eyes of the blind, he could have he could have kept Lazarus from dying. Jesus was groaning in himself or deeply moved within. He groaned in himself is the translation for the idea that he was moved with indignation in himself. This is found in both verse 33 and 32. Dr. Fruchtenbaum asks, what does this mean? It says he was angry, indignant. He may have been angry at death itself, or he may have been angry at the loud wailing, which was a common practice at Jewish funerals. One can still hear this ululation in the Middle East. Okay, so we just talked about that. I do not know what ululation is. Jesus commands the stone to be rolled away. Now this also ties back into what he said earlier. Jesus could have, by his own power, moved the stone. Yet he told the women to, to roll the stone away. And he, he, he told them, Didn't I tell you if you believe, you'd see the glory of God? So their act of faith is, is going to is going to unleash a tremendous miracle, the sign of Jonah. And it's going to answer all their questions and their frustration with Jesus. Um, but but now now think about this: how irrational this act of faith was for them. Lord, he stinketh. It's been four days, so. But yet they were obedient. But it seemed irrational. And that's the problem. We don't want to look silly, right? Lord, I don't want to do that. I don't want to look silly. Lord, you want me to go and pray for this person? It's a total stranger. You know? um, anyway, a lot of truths to glean here. Um, Something I wanted to point out, I just want to throw this out to you. It's always taught that he wept because of, of Lazarus' death and all the death and so forth. Dr. Fruchtenbaum touches on that. But I disagree with that. I think because, first of all, he knew all along. He even said Lazarus has died. I'm going to go wake him. There was no reason for him to weep because death had taken his friend. He's going to raise him and glorify himself and God by it. What I think his anger and his weeping was about was the unbelief of everyone around him. Wailing and, and even Mary and Martha and the disciples are like, well, Lord, if you would have been here, you could have fixed it, but now... He's dead. Think about the unbelief because he had already raised some from the dead. I think his anger and his weeping is you're so hard hearted you can't, you should be rejoicing and yet you're weeping in unbelief. And I think we really just soak that in. I think it will. Well, I think that's right on. Uh, did they already? Knew, they know he's the son of God or presumably that's who they believe him to be yeah. and he's standing right there and and they're weeping and wailing and right crying like there's some kind of loss there and he's like like there's Boy, no hope. heels there so there's that that it explains the anger and then the weeping just oh you just don't see it you don't you don't believe do you, that's what, and think about it. Believest thou this? Do you believe this? I think also they didn't realize just what all he could do. 
that they kind of limited his power. Yeah, absolutely. If you'd been here, you could have saved him. Yeah, but now, but death, now that he's dead, death is one. So yeah, you want to go eat somewhere after the funeral? <laughs> <laughs> you know. So. And boy, what about our anemic faith? Does it make him in some ways frustrated or angry? Now, he knows, this is the thing, his humanity, he's responding this way, he knows that we're weak. He knew that Peter would deny him. And yet, we're held back by this unbelief. So I have something really exciting to add to this. Okay, let's hear it. <laughs> She about jumped out of her chair. <laughs> Faith like a child, right? Mm -hmm. My sister's seven-year-old. He's just like a little prophet. <laughs> so when we're FaceTiming on Messenger to talk about, you know, Grandma dying, we're in the middle of a fight, and then we get the text that Grandma died, and I was like, I got punched in the gut. Anyway, so all of that little fighting we did just seemed like so stupid at that mm -hmm. point. <laughs> but anyway, um, we were talking about our boys' reactions to my grandma's dying. And Benaya, Benaya, when she asked him, what do you think, of, what, how do you feel about Grandma being in heaven, you know, and he just paused for a second, and he goes, yay, <laughs> and he goes, she's not in a wheelchair, she is not in pain anymore, she's with the angels, you know, and Jesus, and she goes, and he, what up? and he was like, uh, and he goes, she's in, how did he say, oh, she's in a pool of righteousness right now. <laughs> 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 seven year old? Oh yes. My God. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Preach. Another, <laughs> another Billy Graham. Oh, wow. So, his name's Benaya. She named him after David's, one of David's mighty men. Uh, wow. Sounds like if she hasn't got it figured out, at least he has. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I actually had Hope to say that she was like really like, just bringing up stuff to be sad about, you know. I was like, look at your son. Yeah, he's, he's the exact yeah. example of what we need to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My mom said, Pool of I don't know if it's in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a new one. Um, I don't know if it's in the Bible or if it's just something. I think it's, she said it was came from the Bible. You're supposed to weep when they're born and ce celebrate when they pass. Weep when a child is born because they're born into sin and if they're yeah. saved. That you celebrate when they go out. Oh, there's I don't know. I look at little Erica's face. There's no way I could. Well, there's. Yeah. It's the human thing of. Not human. Um, <laughs> selfishness that gets right in the way of that because you want them here still. Exactly. And so you have nice. to. Yeah, you have to keep it past it saying, ah, just see where he is. I want him here. So that's why. Struggle. It, it is a struggle, but I wouldn't call back any of my family. Sure. I mean, my nieces and nephews that died in the train car crashes and stuff. They're with God. I'm. I wouldn't call them back for anything. Yeah. For me, or nothing. Nothing else. We ought to be. We ought to be happy that. Uh, God's will, so God's will was done. Well, they wouldn't come back either, given the chance. So. No, they wouldn't. And in a, in a trillion years, I mean, this little gap of separation. Yeah, totally be nothing. Nothing. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and our dialogue tonight. And thank you, God, for the truth of the scripture that we have believed upon the resurrection and the life in Jesus and that he will raise us on that day and he's given us eternal life. So we know that when this body fails, Lord, our lives do not end. In fact, they really begin in a pool of righteousness as we learned tonight, God. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, God, for these promises. Help us to trust and just rest. Thank you, Lord, for the simplicity of the gospel, the, the, the power of your ability to save those whom you've called, and 
those whom you've chosen from before the foundation of the world. And Father, that if we foolishly choose not to participate in that work of redemption, it does not hold or stay your hand or, or thwart your work, God. Your work will be accomplished and, and we'll miss out on a great blessing and reward because of our fear or whatever it is that holds us back. So God, help us to, to be co-laborers with you in sowing the seed of the Word of God, in watering the seed of the Word of God, and harvesting when the harvest comes. And so, God, we just thank you for tonight, our study. Be with those, Lord, many prayer requests that have been out, uh, put out tonight. JJ and Sharon. And we pray for Andrew. We pray, God, for um, Ashley's, dad. Ashley's father. His heart would be softened. He would believe. Ashley, Lord, should she not be discouraged? And God, just be with our church family tonight. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name.